I want to welcome everybody to Building Employee Engagement through High Performing Managers. We have a great opportunity today to really highlight some of Gallup's latest research about the importance of high performance management on the area of employee engagement and workplace success. Gallup's a pioneer in that employee engagement field and so we have two experts today joining me to really answer some questions and, and highlight some things about employee engagement and high performance management for you. Um, I want to introduce you today to Dr. Jim Harder. He's Gallup's Chief Scientist of Workplace Management here and Well-Being. So Dr. Harder is going to provide his expert insight around what Gallup knows about the role that managers play in engaging their workplaces. And we're also joined by Dean Jones. He's Gallup's talent architect, talent development architect. And Dean will help us think about research that we have on managers and employee engagement and how that can help shape curriculum that organizations can use to improve workplace performance at the manager level. So welcome, Dr. Jim Harder. Welcome, Dean Jones. Um, I think we're going to start with Dr. Jim Harder today. One of the questions that I think is a great place to begin, Jim, is what is Gallup's definition of employee engagement? Um, if you could open up with sharing a little bit about how Gallup defines employee engagement, I think that's a great place for us to start. Sure. Thanks, Heather. And uh, this definition actually comes from decades of work studying productive teams across a broad range of environments, but employee engagement is the involvement in and enthusiasm for work in your workplace, and um, it's uh, it's not just about being satisfied at work, it's not about being happy at work, although those things do correlate with engagement, they're insufficient. It's not just about giving people perks, it's really the nexus between the workplace attitudes people bring uh, to work and performance, and also good lives, but uh, but we've studied performance outcomes, and that's the basis for this definition. So it's involvement in and enthusiasm for work in your workplace. Mm -hmm. So why does it matter? I'm always curious, and I have clients ask me a lot, um, you know, why does engagement matter? What impact does engagement have on organizational outcomes? Well, we've, uh, we've found there, there are 12 elements. These have been tested through eight different iterations of uh, te a technique we call meta-analysis. Um, and engagement matters uh, because it links to important outcomes that organizations are interested in. Um, so if you start at the organizational level, organizations that have high levels of engagement in the top decile of our database uh, achieve 147% earnings per share in comparison to their competition. Even those in the top quarter achieve 90%. Uh, earnings per share in comparison to their competition. And um, at the local level for teams that managers lead, uh, engagement, and the reason that those company level findings emerge is because these companies have uh, a surplus of managers who engage their teams and those managers who engage their teams at a high level have uh, about 22% higher profitability uh, than other teams. And that's because they keep customers engaged, they have Higher, higher producing employees in their workplaces, better absenteeism, lower turnover rates, um, fewer accidents on the job, less shrinkage or theft, uh, fewer defects, higher quality work, all those things add up to higher profit, which then leads to the outcomes organizations are interested in. So what do organizations need to do so that they can engage workers to perform at that higher level? Well, the first thing is that you got to get the metric right. You've got to have a metric that is, is situated and defined by elements that predict performance outcomes and are actionable for, uh, for workers and managers. And so we found they fit into really four general categories. Uh, one is around role clarity, and you have to have questions that measure role clarity that actually are tested scientifically and that, uh, that are actionable. And so role clarity is essential. It's a basic um, another one you build on that is, is individual development. Um, uh, you engage workers by developing uh, people through recognition, through putting them in the right jobs to begin with, through, um, through having a manager who cares about them as an individual, and thinking about their future in the organization. And then the, the, the third is you've got to connect people to a higher purpose. Uh, you engage them by connecting them to a higher purpose or, or mission in the organization or, or a team uh, beyond themselves. And, uh, and then the, the fourth is to help them see progress over time, to, to gauge their progress, help them learn and grow, and help them think about 
their pro progress throughout the organization over time in individually. So th those are four areas. There's a lot that goes into it, though, from an organizational standpoint that, that, that really feeds into mm -hmm. uh, increasing engagement levels over time. Absolutely. So, Jim, I'm going to pause for a second and remind people that if you have questions as we go throughout today's conversation, please be sure and email us at live at gallup, G-A-L-L-U-P dot com. Live at gallup dot com. We'll take your questions. If you're having any technical difficulties, um, we can certainly get that straightened out for you. But but any of your questions about engagement would be um, welcomed any time throughout our conversation today. So one thing that, that I hear clients ask about a lot, Jim, is how effective are organizations across the globe doing when it comes to engaging their employees? How effective are most organizations when it comes to creating a culture of engagement? So we've collected a, a lot of data on or a, lo a lot of organizations over time individually and uh, encompassing Oh, about 49, almost 50,000 business units where we have actual performance data. So that's that goes into the validation. But when we look globally, we have a world poll, the, the only world poll of its kind um, that uh, samples collects data on representative samples of 98% of the world's population. That allows us to have an, an objective view on how people feel about their workplace, how engaged they are. And uh, to answer your question, Heather, 13% of people in the world are engaged, or what we call engaged. So that's at a level where they wow. are producing high levels for the organization. 24% are actively disengaged. So in other words, um, organizations aren't doing too well overall um, around the world. Uh, more actively engaged workers working against the organization than that 13% than that working for the organization. Now, this, these findings vary by country, of course, and in the U.S., for instance, about 30% engaged. The troubling statistic to me, though, is that that number hasn't moved much over the last decade and a half since we've been tracking it here in the U.S., but the reality is it doesn't have to be that way. Um, as we've studied organizations, we see some that have moved, uh, in fact, uh, a lot of them have moved up to uh, a very high level where they have over double that level of engagement um, over time and they've done some purposeful things to get there. And so uh, there's a lot organizations can do and I, I'm, I'm confident that in the future we can improve those overall numbers by just putting the right practices in place. So tell us more about how those organizations have, have made that jump. What are the kinds of things that they're, that they're doing or, or maybe first start with whose responsibility is engagement? So. I mean, because to me, that's that's pretty troubling, and and even as a consumer, we can kind of all feel that when you go into any establishment, you know when you've got an engaged employee or when you've got that actively disengaged employee, and then there's that big chunk of the population that's in that not engaged. Um, are those not engaged engageable, and and whose responsibility is it to figure that out and do something about it? That's a good question, and uh, the reality is uh, everybody in the workplace has some responsibility, but um, there, there is one, if I was going to point to one kind of silver bullet or uh, I don't know what you want to call it, but a central kind of um, element in engaging workplaces, it's the manager. It starts with the manager. About 70% of engagement at the team level is attributable to the manager. Now that's both looking at the talents of the manager uh, that they come with, so their inherent talents. It's looking at uh, how their employees perceive what they do on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And then also uh, the engagement level of the manager themselves. That can account for at least 70% mm -hmm. of, of engagement. And so it's important to get the right managers and the right jobs and to, and to also uh, teach managers uh, what they need to do to be effective. So there's a lot of it that can be learned and taught, and there's some of it that's more inherent. Now to, to kind of uh, build on top of that, Heather, um, at the organizational level, we have seen some patterns in organizations that have moved the needle over time. Um, they have worked on getting the right managers in place and built developmental programs uh, around, so it really centered uh, development around engagement elements for those managers themselves and their employees. But uh, they've also built really good communication systems internally so that people know why engagement is important to the organization and so that people know how it fits into the rest of the organization. So there's also an element of connecting it to the strategy of the organization, make sure that that's really coherent and that people mm -hmm. understand. So it isn't a separate silo, it's a part of the ongoing, uh, el the ongoing um, part of the organization that they're tracking and, and progressing and, and that it fits into the strategy at an executive level in the organization. And then um, 
Go ahead, Heather. You're going to ask something. Well, I was going to ask. Someone asked if you could please repeat those four things to em engage them. What are those things that need to be present? Oh, for an engaged employee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so role clarity is essential. So one of the questions we ask on our on our instrument uh, is is do you know what is expected of you at work? Um, still, only a little over half the people in the world that we study clearly know what's expected of them at work, and so there's a lot of work to be done just on role clarity. The second one is development. Um, the third is uh, connecting people to a higher purpose or, or team, so it's it's uh, that team aspect. And the fourth is progress. Very good. So another question that's come in, Jim, is is what does the the profile, the strengths profile, look like of of a great manager, or a, a, an engaging manager? Yeah. And so um, we've we've put a lot of effort into answering that question. Um, and we've studied the talents of successful managers over time and contrasted them with other managers. And we found there are five talents that you can select for objectively uh, using an, an objective instrument. You can select for these, these talents that make people uh, more prone. So different from what they might learn, but they're inherent, uh, natural, predisposed talents. Uh, and I'll list those off for you here real quickly. We can send you more information on this for those that are interested. Um, the One is that they're motivators. They challenge themselves and their teams. To, to reach high levels of performance. Um, the second is that they, they're inherently assertive people. They push past obstacles, adversity, and resistance. They can make tough decisions and make people feel okay about it. The third is that they, they have high accountability. Um, they create structure, processes, help their teams deliver on expectations, and they assume responsibility for the success of the team. So they have high ownership and accountability. The uh, the fourth is relationships. They're inherently good at building individual relationships and getting to know their, their employees as individuals so that they can cater to, to those needs and put people in positions where they can maximize their talents. So they build positive, engaging work environments and, and build strong relationships over time um, through employees and customers. And then the, the, the fifth one is decision making. They're, they're exceptional at solving complex issues problems and thinking about the overall business when they're solving problems and planning for contingencies, um, balancing competing interests, taking a more analytical approach. Now there are very few people that have that composition of those five and um, we've done some research on that and we found that if you're looking for really high, what we call high manager talent where there's a critical mass of those five, it's about one in ten people in uh, workplaces that we've had a chance to study. And so there's uh, selection is important. There's another two in ten that have um, that have what we call basic manager talent. That have you know enough manager talent where you if you develop them in the right way they can also achieve really high levels. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't mean you can't help the rest of the pool progress. You can, but it's just more efficient and easier if you get the right talents in the place in place to begin with. Very good. Thanks. A couple of other questions that are coming in that I think are kind of related um, is about engagement in different types of organizations. So, for example, how do you engage people when they've been here for a long time, 10 plus years? Are, are people with tenure as engageable as newer people? And also in conjunction with that question, um, a question about what if you're a pretty flat organization? If there isn't a hierarchical structure to promote people, how do you develop them in, in that kind of an environment and keep them engaged? So I'll take the tenure one first. Um, we do find in our, in our general uh, database that um, there's a honeymoon effect. When people join organizations, they're a little more likely to be engaged in the first six months or so, probably get a bit more attention. Um, then after about six months, on average, engagement starts to drop. For uh, some organizations, there's a U-shaped curve where the highest tenured people are also a little bit more engaged. That tends to be the case uh, when uh, the more tenured people are upper management. Um, the, uh, but in many organizations, it, it continues to decline, which is really um, not, not a good thing. But uh, again, it doesn't have to be that way. We've studied organizations that have worked on this for some time, and they have as high a level of engagement for the tenured people as they do for the, uh, the honeymooners, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And um, so you you can do it. And the, the thing to keep in mind, though, is that when, as people become tenured, they don't lose their need to progress and to learn and grow and to uh, to have an opportunity to do what they do best. All of those elements that lead to high levels of engagement 
uh, are still there and important regardless of tenure. And it's a, sometimes it's a matter of just uh, redefining the job, thinking mm -hmm. about how people can continually progress within their job or to whatever job might fit them uh, within the organization or elsewhere. Um, the second question was about flat organizations, um, right. less hierarchical, and, and what you can do in a, in a flat organization. Um, the, the key, I, I'd say, I just kind of point to one key thing, because I've had this question quite a bit lately. Um, if you have a flatter organization, can you, can you build an environment where everything is, is kind of loose and, and less accountability and still have high levels of engagement? You can, as long as you have a critical kind of go-to person for each individual who's responsible for their development. The thing you can't overlook in a flat organization is that you have a single person who's responsible for each individual's development so that they're thinking about that development over time and thinking about how to engage that person over time. In a more matrixed organization it can work just as effectively but but just I'd, I'd recommend don't overlook that, mm -hmm. that we still need development is in response to another person or other people and so we need to always uh, keep that in mind I think. Very good. Thanks, Jim. One question about moving people from actively disengaged to engaged. Um, in, in your research, have you seen, is it possible? Can you take someone who's actively disengaged, can we move them to the engaged category? How often do you see that happen? Yeah, it's, it is more difficult. Now, there are, there's a certain percentage of people um, in the uh, actively disengaged category who you might think of as uh, neurotic. Um, predisposed, <laughs> but there's a big chunk of, of people who are predisposed, no matter whether they go, they'll be grouchy, right? Uh, but but uh, there's a certain chunk of people in that category who are very changeable. They either have a manager who isn't supporting them effectively or coworkers who aren't, uh, who aren't pulling their share of the weight and, and don't, they don't feel their coworkers are committed to quality. There's any number of things that can contribute to that that are very changeable, and you can move actively disengaged workers to engaged. In fact, I've uh, studied some organizations where you notice that there's a team that was at the bottom of our database in year one and jumps up to the top, and so you, you kind of question that um, mm -hmm. in year two, and so you go back and do a little investigation, and you find, well, uh, one of uh, a couple things happened, and the, 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 the central thing generally is that the, the manager changed. Mm. So they may have had a manager who's dragging down the team, and uh, somebody probably noticed also they're dragging down performance and probably a change was made. Bring in a new manager uh, who maybe randomly had good talent, maybe systematically had good talent, depending on how they, what kind of process is in place, and the group jumps up and, and morale increases. So getting that kind of central, uh, uh, that cent center point of uh, a, a great manager in place is, is essential, I think. Um, That's and in, in other cases, it's just a concerted effort to focus on the right elements, focus mm -hmm. on the actionable elements that, that people can do something about and, and that are re really related to business results. Perfect. Well, Jim, one of the common threads that I keep hearing is how important the right manager for a team is in, in the whole engagement equ equation. Um, and I think it's a perfect time for, for two things. First, I want to remind everyone, lots of great questions, and many of these questions relate to the manager impact on engagement. So I want to encourage people, as you have questions, keep sending them to live at gallup.com. That's live at Gallup, G-A-L-L-U-P dot com. Um, and I think it's a perfect time to invite Dean Jones into the conversation here. Um, Dean, some questions for you about, about the manager's impact on engagement and, and what that looks like and, and what we can do about it as an organization. When, when you think of all the demands on a manager in their busy lives these days, um, what are the common challenges that, that managers face? What do you see there? No, that's great. That's a great question, Heather. Um, challenges, I think, and it's interesting. We see this as we work with managers and 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 work on developing managers. Is mm -hmm. for a lot of managers when when they moved into that role, oftentimes they moved from an individual contributor role. So in many cases, they were they they were either experienced and had a significant amount of experience or tenure in that individual contributor role, or they just performed really really well in that role. And somebody said. 
this is a great person, let's put that person in a manager role or in a supervisory role. But in many cases, what had them be successful in that individual contributor role won't have them be successful in the manager role. So it's making that kind of transition so that they understand, you know, part of their job now, uh, there's a, a saying that the American Management Association used to use, which is that management is about getting um, um, work done through people and people done through work. So for a lot of managers, it's helping them kind of make that transition to understand it's about the outcomes, and, I, and I'm, I'm still committed to the outcomes. And at the same time, um, part of my job is getting people done, is developing people. Uh, Jim pointed to it a minute ago in, in what he was saying, that, that that piece about role clarity and that piece about individual development is really at the foundation of engagement. So for managers to start to, to to start to see their role in those terms is a, is a big deal. It's actually really surprising. It's interesting. As we've been, over the last year or so, we've been developing this new high performance management course. One of the most interesting things to hear as we as we hear managers talk is for many of them, they're, they're either not clear that developing people is part of their role or they don't really have access to it. They don't really understand how to go about doing that. So it's, it's, it's just really a fascinating piece. Very good. So another question for you, Dean. Obviously, there's been a lot of research around great managers or around managers and, and what separates or distinguishes a great manager from an average or below average manager. Um, yeah. Can you share a little bit about what we've discovered that sets great managers apart from the rest? Yeah. So certainly, as Jim said, we've been studying managers for a long time and studying both manager talent, but also, you know, over the last two decades, we've developed hundreds of thousands of managers around the world and helped them to be more effective in the, in the role that they've got. The thing that we've seen as we studied managers, um, the thing that we've seen was we've really seen three three common approaches or three common kind of characteristics in those great managers. And we've tried to start to frame it up so that um, whether you're, you've got that high talent that Jim talked about or if you don't, that you can start to think about what those characteristics are. Uh, the three characteristics are, one is that they're strengths-based. And by strengths-based, it's not just that they know their own strengths, but that they think about talent. And they think about having the right talent in each role. So they're thinking about, do I have the person with the right talent? Are, are they a fit for the particular role? And how do I develop their talent so that they can deliver excellence in the role? Uh, the second characteristic is that they're engagement focused. And it's for them, engagement is a lens for being able to think about the work that they do as a manager. So it's not just a survey or an event, it's really an approach, it's really the way that they think about how do they bring themselves to bear as a manager. Um, it's, it's interesting, um, I, I was talking with one manager who we were, we were interviewing him and he talked, I, I asked him, when is it that you cover engagement in your team meetings or when is it that you deal with engagement in the course of being a manager? And he said to me, e every single meeting is about engagement. That's really the only topic. You know, he, he was, in, it was, what he was pointing to is it was just the lens that he looked through it when he saw the team, when he saw their outcomes, when he saw the work that they needed to do. Um, the third thing is that they're performance oriented. So, and I think sometimes this gets lost a little bit, right? I think that um, as they think about talent, they're thinking about talents that translates to performance. As they're thinking about engagement, they're thinking about engagement as it translates to performance. So they're thinking about how do I orient each person around the outcomes that they need to deliver? So it starts with things like Jim talked about a minute ago about setting right the right expectations and understanding somebody's talent and being able to shape kind of the, the, the work that they do and the way that they're recognized, the way that they're engaged, right? So there's lots of things that go into that. They also, with regard to being performance oriented, they also think a lot about what are the outcomes we need to do as a team and how do I, how do I shape the work that we're doing Doing and how do I shape the team in order to achieve that work? So again, it's strengths-based, engagement-focused, performance-oriented. Those are sort of the three things that we see are common in our in the best managers. Very good. And and people are asking how how do effective managers really leverage the strengths or leverage strengths as a part of their management style? Ah, that's a great question. I think it starts, you know, it's an interesting thing. I think strengths really starts with the individual manager. And I think there's two, there's really two levels to think about it. 
One is really understanding your own talent and understanding uh, both your strengths and your weaknesses. Sometimes I think, you know, particularly people that love strengths tend to think about the strengths and not think about those areas necessarily where they may be weak. So it's really having good self-awareness about both of those things. So to understand, you know, sort of your composition, you're having good self-awareness yourself. Um, one of the things we see, and Jim can probably talk about this, sometimes we see is managers, you know, when they don't necessarily have great self-awareness they're trying to create more of themselves um, we were uh, we were doing a manager course in DC last week um, where this great person in the course who was talking about how she just hired somebody who was just like her and uh, we we're kind of laughing about it in the course because it's what a lot of managers do they 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 see their own talent they see the success they've had so they go try to replicate it right mm -hmm. and one of the one of the benefits of having great self-awareness is you can see beyond your own talent right so that you can really understand how different people hit performance objectives using different approaches the other thing that it allows you to be able to do is to individualize so one of the things we know that great is that they're great at being able to individualize they understand that they've got to think about each person uniquely and set up their work set up the the ways that you motivate them set up the ways that they get engaged set up their recognition in ways that are highly individualized so the more that you understand about your own talent the more you understand about talent and strengths the more inclined you are to be able to think through that lens and apply that in the way that you manage the team so lots of people are coming in with variations of the question, how can managers then be more effective in driving employee engagement for their teams? Oh, that's great. Uh, great question. I think one is, it goes back to that thing I said a minute ago, is uh, I think it starts from thinking about employee engagement as a, as a lens, right? Mm -hmm. So as opposed to, I think for a lot of managers, they think about employee engagement as a survey that we're doing or as a set of conversations that they're supposed to have. Um, we were, you know, when we were first um, doing kind of the, the, the background research for this course that we built, uh, this high performance management course, uh, it was interesting because we we talked to a lot of managers and we were interested in their relationship with engagement like when they get their engagement report what you know you know what's the first thing they think right mm -hmm. it's it's it, what's interesting is for a lot of them they don't necessarily have a powerful relationship with engagement right in some cases it's like okay if there's relief right you know okay I, you know this is good enough or oh I'm in trouble and I don't necessarily know what to do that they don't necessarily have an access to how do I go intervene in the level of engagement. I think that there's a couple things about that. One is, this is where I think the Q12 is a, just a powerful instrument. Um, part of it, even whether or not you, you assess using the Q12 in your organization, the Q12 is a lens that enables you to be able to look at, as, as, as Jim said a moment ago, those elements that are critical for engagement. So as a manager, if I'm looking at and using those 12 elements to think about how do I work with people, I'm more inclined to be effective. And then on top of it, if you've got then the data, right? So if, you've, if you're using the Q12 as an instrument, it validates, it, it enables you to be more effective because you know you've got some, some um, quantitative evidence, if you will, to support the, the work that you're doing. So I think that's a really important piece in terms of driving engagement is to use that uh, to be able to start to shape the conversations that you're having. Um, the other thing, and, and I'll tell you this is thing, we, we often have to coach managers. Sometimes managers um, get kind of stuck in a rut where they think it's a set of team conversations they, don't, they have to have, um, as opposed to that it's both, it's both having those individual conversations with associates as well as team conversations. And one of the things that we've tried to structure with people is to give people both guidance and tools and direction around how to actually shape both those team conversations and those individual conversations so that they can be more effective in in understanding the associates and uh, the associate and and being able to drive engagement very good so Dean earlier Jim Harder mentioned that idea that there's some people who are naturally talented to be managers others who have kind of that moderate talent and and those who probably are, are maybe better in a different role how do you develop managers of different talent levels 
Oh, that's great. I think, you know, regardless of the organization, there's going to be a continuum of talent. And I think um, uh, if we look, and Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we, we the thing that we know is, roughly speaking, about 18% of managers have what we would characterize as high talent. So, is that Jim, that's right, correct? Yeah, yeah, of people in current manager roles, yeah. In, in current manager roles, so we know there's this of of the of that of the the gamut of managers in your organization. You're going to have it, roughly speaking, give or take 18 percent that we would characterize as having that kind of high talent. We know that another two in ten, or another roughly 20 percent of the workforce, has uh, talent that then can be developed. Right. Mm -hmm. So part of what we've tried to do is is think about, okay, what are the ways to be able to accelerate the development of those folks who have talent, for whom management is intuitive? How do we help then start to develop the talent for people that have that foundation of talent, but it needs to be developed? And then how do you provide structure for those managers who don't? So you're always going to have certain managers in your organization. Um, it's interesting, years ago when we were starting to develop managers, we would structure a conversation and we would give it to a group of managers and say, go have conversations like this. And one of the th interesting things is you'd see those managers who had high talent, they could take a conversation like that and kind of extrapolate from that. They could go have conversations that were sort of variations on the theme, but that were all, all, all pointed toward the same intention. What we could see is with managers that didn't have talent, they didn't know how to go, as, as we said, have conversations like that. They were stuck, right? So we've really tried to help structure those conversations, and I think it's one of the things that you've got to do um, as you're coaching managers who may not necessarily have native talent or innate talent in, in that way is to help them structure the conversation, give them tools so that they're really set up to be able to um, have the ask the kind of questions, listen for the kind of things that somebody who had that innate talent would. Um, it, it, it's uh, you know sometimes I call it like uh, dance lessons for people that don't have a rhythm. You know <laughs> it's um, you know you gotta you gotta give them kind of the structure so that they can they can go do they can go do what we know those natural managers will be able to do. What's interesting too is and fascinating for us is as we work with those folks who do have that innate talent or have that foundational level talent that can be developed. When you give it to them, it accelerates their development, right? So the cool thing is, is that what you get is, is it feels intuitively right to them. It feels like the right kind of conversations they should have, or the right way of thinking around it, and um, and and they're able to then they're able to then bring themselves to a level of proficiency and a level of excellence more quickly. One other piece about this, and this is another thing, it's an interesting thing, but but. Um, we've tried to provide constructs, and one of the, as we think about this, is to provide constructs plans for looking at themselves, looking at their teams, looking at their environment that's really powerful, that enables them to, to be able to focus and to be able to start to intuitively understand what, what actions to take. Um, it's, it, it, you know, a lot of times in organizations we try to shape managers with rules and policies and procedures to try to focus people, um, and that works only to some degree. Um, the more that we can shape the way that a manager sees themselves and sees their environment, sees the associates they work with, um, using tools like strengths, using tools like engagement to be able to do that, the more they're naturally given to than, than taking the right actions uh, by themselves. Very good. So I'm going to remind people again live at gallup.com for your questions. Many great questions coming in here. So Dean and Jim, I'm going to give you both an opportunity to chime in on some questions. I'm also great. going to let our, our viewers know that um, if, if you want more information about engagement, a site that you can seek out is http, it's q12.gallup.com. So q12, the letter Q, the number 12, q12.gallup.com is a place you can go to. And I'm just going to scroll through some of the questions. I've highlighted a few here that seem to kind of embody um, common themes that I'm hearing. What can managers do starting right here, right now, today um, to improve employee engagement? What are simple ways they can begin? Jim, do you want to start? Yeah, well, I think the first thing is to hold you and your team's accountable you've got it and that's one of the things we've seen in in very high performing organizations that have moved the needle over time is that there's a there's a culture of accountability and that starts with getting 
the measurement right, both on engagement and on the outcomes you expect the team to, to produce. I think that's very foundational. Mm -hmm. And then you, you've got to have the right principles in place and the right measurement to help them know uh, how they're progressing on those things. Dean? Yeah. I, and I think it's, um, just to add to that, there's a couple things I think. One is is just asking questions. So just asking basic questions about what do you like about your work? What's engaging for you? What's, you know, what, what are the, as, as you look back at the last two weeks or the last two months, what are the things that were the best, the, the best days at work for you? Or activities that you worked in that were the best. So starting to, to ask questions and start to understand well, how, how is that associate comprised as, as we look at that person just sort of understanding who they are, right? And then being able to focus that, um, the, 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 the very first question is do I know what's expected of me? So one is, is being able to establish that to be able to start and talk about the expectations for the role and the expectations specific to that person. Those are two actions that, that people can take, that managers can take that immediately starts to get them in the world of how do I engage this person. And yeah, the other one would be uh, get to know the, the strengths of each individual you manage and so that you can uh, develop them based on who they are. Too often, as Dean mentioned, too often uh, people go into a room, you know, sitting down with a group of folks that you manage and, uh, and ask the question, why can't these people be more like me? Well, they're probably not and that's probably a good thing. And so you, yeah. to get some language around those strengths helps immensely. In fact, we've seen in the data that uh, managers who focus on strengths get uh, about twice the growth uh, trajectory on employee engagement in comparison to those that don't. So there's mm -hmm. a lot to be done right there. Huge. Yep. So a couple of other threads that I'm seeing in our question conversation here. How do we employ? Uh, how do we engage employees in times of change, mm -hmm. and is engagement different in unionized environments? Jim, do you want to start? Well, I think that uh, one of the things we've seen in, in times of change is to don't forget about the basics. You know, we've been kind of mm -hmm. covering some of the basics here, but when we studied, we had a chance. We've been studying this long enough to track employee engagement when the economy uh, dropped after 2008, and then rebounded somewhat, but um, we could all argue over whether it's rebounded or not, but it, uh, it did drop in 2008, no, no question about that. And the uh, individuals that we uh, surveyed that maintained high levels of engagement and high commitment to their organization had somebody who still encouraged their development during that time, in other words, helped them see the future. Um, mm -hmm. You've got to have a manager and leadership that helps them see where they're headed uh, when times are tough. We've tracked earnings per share for companies that uh, during the down economy and um, what, what, what happened uh, was that the organizations that had really high levels of engagement and maintained high levels of engagement during the down economy, they held their own. They may not have uh, blown the roof off of financials, but they held their own compared to their competition who sank. Um, and then in an up economy, they outpaced their competition. So it, the, a lot of the same principles matter it's just a re-emphasis on some of the basics, like you know, when when we have when there's layoffs, uh, people change their roles uh, somewhat because they've got to take over some of their coworkers, their ex coworkers' roles, etc. And so, focusing back on knowing what's expected of of me and and helping people uh, be in jobs where they do what they do best, that can that can be uh, a little bit more difficult, and you have to kind of reframe that for people during times of change. Yeah, you know, it's it's an interesting thing, and 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 we've seen this. During times of change, it's the manager becomes even more important. So managers are critical during those times of change because they help kind of translate what's happening into what should I do now? How should I feel about this? How should I think about this? So it's even more important in times of change that you've got a good manager and you've got somebody who's connected to each associate, right? So that there's somebody that that associate can go to to say, hey, like, help me make sense of this, right? Help me get comfortable with how what's happening here how should I think about this and then how do how do I operate when things are changing around me so that's it's really it's just really critical one of the things I think for managers one piece is is communicating and I think for you know I, I often say you know if, if you communicated something once and people learned it I'd be out of a job so you know it, it's you have to communicate over and over and over again so so that people can they, they hear it but then it becomes part of who they are Mm -hmm. So, 
Uh, one ch one challenge in times of change is managers need to really over communicate. They need to be able to help understand, help folks understand. Part part of what managers do during those times is help understand, uh, help associates understand not just the what but the why. So here's what we're doing. Here's what's happening. Here's where we're focused. But here's why this is happening, so that people have some context. And I think that um, e even if you look at generational research, uh, th this is more and more become more and more critical for engaging folks, is that they really understand what the what the why is, and that that's being communicated, uh, particularly during times of change. Yeah, I think the reason for that, Dean, is that. Uh People during a time, times of change, people can go one direction or the other. They can go into fight or flight mode, or they can go into um, opportunity mode, and that conduit makes mm -hmm. the difference. Uh huh. Completely. Completely. Heather. So another great question coming through here is how do we build the engagement managers? So we're expecting a lot of managers creating engagement throughout the organization, but how do we build the engagement of managers? Yeah. Well, I'll just speak to a little bit of the research on that. We we have done um, a number of studies where we've looked at we call it called the cascade analysis, where we look at uh, engagement across different levels in organizations. And so, if you think about engagement, uh, fundamentally, engagement is a local level phenomenon. It's something that happens between your team, your local team, your manager, also influenced by other layers in the organization and decisions that are made throughout other layers. But for an executive, they're they're the, who they're concerned with in terms of engagement primarily are their direct reports, right? And then their mm -hmm. direct reports are probably they're probably managers and managers, and then they have a, a group of managers that they're managing. So we've seen uh, statistically there is a cascade effect where organizations that have higher levels of engagement among executives and middle managers have higher uh, engagement at the front lines, and it, it does work down through the organization in that kind of uh, fashion. So in terms of engaging managers, it's a lot of the same principles that we've been talking about. Um, they're based on, on human nature, human needs in mm -hmm. the workplace. Now what goes into those elements could be very different depending on, so what goes into clarity of expectations, what goes into having a chance to do what you do best could be very different depending on the job though. Yeah. Very good. One, of the, one of the things we know about that, and it's, it's interesting, one of the things that's unique about managers is that they have uh, a lot of relationships that they have to manage. So they've got kind of this 360 degrees of relationships that they manage in an organization. So they're managing relationships with their peers, uh, with other managers in the organization, with their team and the individuals on their team, sometimes with clients or customers, with the leadership of the organization. And it really speaks to the thing that Jim just said, which is what's oftentimes is when, you know, where, what makes engaging managers a little more complex is helping them understand all those expectations. Because one of the challenging things about all those relationships is that the expectations in each one of those relationships, in each one of those dynamics, in each of those relationships, the expectations may be different, right? Leaders may have a different expectation of a manager than their peers do or than the team does. So it's really helping them kind of unpack all those different relationships and what the expectations are around those relationships to help them to, 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 to have the sense that they understand those and then can fulfill on them. Very good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a couple of more questions. We've had so many wonderful questions come through. I want, I want to promise that we will get all of your questions answered because some of them are very specific scenario types of questions. So we'll be sure that we get back in touch with each and every one of you that have asked a question. So continue to ask if you have them, even if we're running short on time. Um, and I'll also give a couple of, of places where you can follow up rewatch this this broadcast and have access to the things that we've shared today. Um, one of the questions coming through I think that would be best for you Dr. Harder is about generational differences when it comes mm. to engagement. Is it harder to engage Generation X, Generation Y, the Millennials um, than other generations? What's your research finding? Well the the, uh, the the most highly engaged generation this is kind of, and this kind of speaks to a general management principle, I think, um, is uh, that group of traditionalists. These are people who could be retired but aren't, but are working, right? So they're probably working because they have a choice. Is that that sort of speaks to autonomy and the importance of autonomy in in, in terms of the workplace. And then you know, the, the, those in the the middle ages, kind of baby boomers, et cetera, a little bit less engaged on average. When you look at the uh, Gen Yers or or millennials, um, there are some differences, but there's huge variation within that group and uh, one of the things that we found 
does differentiate whether that group will stay or leave. And, and as you might expect, the millennials are more likely to say that if the economy improves, they'll look for another job. They're looking for opportunities. They're looking for what their future is, more likely to switch jobs. But those that are engaged are less likely to switch jobs than those that are actively disengaged, even though the average is, is higher in terms of intent to, to leave. Um, but a couple of uh, things that stuck out in the research um, for that group, uh, one is that if they do have a, an opportunity in their job to do what they do best, they are more likely to stay with their organization. Um, um, and then a chance to, to, to develop and to learn and grow. So mm -hmm. I, I interpret that as they're looking at where is my future in this organization. And if I don't see a future, I'll probably look for it somewhere else, and, and, they're, and they're probably more likely to. But I think the thing to, to always keep in mind with regard to generational differences is it does come down to some fundamentals about getting to know the individual um, person and what, what some of their aspirations are, what their talents are, and uh, that will give you the best chance. Very good. And, and someone asked a great question. What is the relationship between and well-being? Between engagement and well-being? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Yes. What's, yeah, that, off. what's that connection between engagement and well-being? Yeah, good, good. Really good question. Um, it, it's it's strong and significant. So engaged workers are about twice as likely to be to be thriving in their lives as those who who are uh, not engaged or actively disengaged. But uh, so so they're more likely to have positive lives from their own subjective viewpoint. But the thing I'd point out though is that there's still a good chunk of engaged workers who are either struggling or suffering in some aspect of their life. So work is one piece of the puzzle, right? So getting engagement right d does improve lives. It, uh, we've done physiological tests to look at cortisol levels and all sorts of things, and engaged workers just have better lives in general. But there's a whole person to think about, too. And you can get the workplace right, but if something else is dragging them down, then they won't have as much resiliency. So we found there are five elements with regard to engagement that employers can all do something about as well, uh, beyond, uh, beyond engagement, five, five elements of well-being. And, and those five, I'll just list them real quickly, are your career well-being or your purpose. That's some of the stuff we've been talking about here uh, today. Your social well-being, that can be addressed in the workplace as well to some extent. Um, we know that there, there's elements you can, you can work on in the workplace related to that. Your financial well-being, we've seen organizations do a lot to help people improve their financial well-being and provide resources there. Um, your uh, physical well-being, of course, wellness programs and, uh, and other things that are in place. Um, physical well-being is really about the amount of energy people bring into the workplace, uh, regardless of their physical status. And then uh, their community well-being. We've seen organizations do a lot of things around community well-being that help improve the overall lives of the individuals and the community in general. And so those are, uh, we don't have time to get into the details of this, but i uh, been glad to follow up with anybody who's interested on it. But um, we've done quite a bit of research in that area, and those five are, to some extent, all actionable by organizations. Um, and uh, certainly well-being is something that uh, can't be completely actionable by organizations, uh, but it's uh, something that organizations can certainly help uh, individuals improve on, and then that, that provides a return to the organization um, beyond engagement. Hmm. Perfect. And, Dean, maybe just one, one question for you that kind of summarizes lots of the questions coming through is what tools are there for helping managers focus on engagement? What can we provide Great. We've we've got a few things that we've got that we've that we've built that we've recently released that are designed specifically to help managers. One is that we've got the Managing for Engagement Kit, which is a kit that, as I said earlier, kind of helps them to understand how to have those individual and those team conversations. Um, and it provides all the tools for being able to do that, plus other resources around that. Um, there's one of the one of the components of that kit is a resource guide that talks about how do you engage people people who've got different kinds of strengths and how do you leverage your strengths as a manager. So really, really useful. The, we include that kit actually in our new high performance management course. So we've got this new course we've just started to offer. Uh, we started piloting it actually in January. Um, 
Um, it is a two-day course. It's designed really to help managers, one, understand their role and what's expected of them, how to think about that, um, how to really start to identify their current management style, and then st how to start to uh, evolve their management style forward, how to integrate what we know the world's best managers are doing into their management style. So they, they're still themselves. They're still able to express themselves through their talent, and at the same time, they're able to do some of the things that we know that the best managers of the world are able to do. Um, just another thing I'll mention as, as we wrap up here, there's lots of questions. What we will do post-webinar post is go back and individually make sure we follow up and get your question answered if it wasn't asked live during the webinar here. We'll, we'll have our team make sure to follow up on those questions. And the other thing to know is that this webcast, if you missed the first part or if you want to re-listen or share with others, um, you can come back to this site and replay it at any time. So. Um, we want to make sure, I, I, I want to thank Jim Harder and Dean Jones so much for both of your presence today, your answers to so many questions. There's lots of specific scenarios that people have questions about, so I know um, these tools will be very helpful to people, but also we'll follow up and answer maybe more specifically or point you in the right direction towards the, the tools. I know some other folks had asked about selection assessments that help us mm -hmm. choose those managers that can do the best job of driving engagement. Engagement. So lots more questions to be answered. Um, stay tuned for future webinars that will help us continue to answer those questions and give you more direction and an opportunity for dialogue and discussion. But big thanks to both Jim and Dean today for your, for your answers, for your thoughts, um, and for sharing the research with everyone.